Hey, how are you? Hope everything's going well. I'm going to be reading from the book Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. I'm on page 50. What is a man for? I think this is chapter 3, page 50. Why does God create Adam? What is a man for? If you know what something is designed to do, then you know its purpose and why. A retriever loves the water, a lion loves the hunt, a hawk loves to soar. It's what they're made for. Desire reveals design, and design reveals destiny. In the case of human beings, our design is also revealed by our desires. Let's take adventure. Adam and all of his sons after him are given an incredible mission. Rule and subdue, be fruitful and multiply. Here is the entire earth, Adam. Explore it, cultivate it, care for it. It is your kingdom. Whoa, talk about an invitation. This is permission to do a heck of a lot more than cross the street. It's a charter to find the equator. It's a commission to build Camelot. Only Eden is a garden at that point. Everything else is wild, so far as we know. No river has been charted, no ocean crossed, no mountain climbed. No one's discovered the molecule or fuel injection or created Beethoven's fit. It's a blank page waiting to be written. A clean canvas waiting to be painted. Most men think they were simply here on earth to kill time, and it's killing them. But the truth is precisely the opposite. The secret longing of your heart, whether it's to build a boat and sail it, or to write a symphony and play it, to plant a field and care for it, those are the things you were made to do. That's what you're here for. Explore, build, conquer. You don't have to tell a boy to do those things for the simple reason that it is his purpose. But it's going to take risk and danger, and there's the catch. Are we willing to live with the level of risk God invites us to? Something inside us hesitates. Let's take another desire. Why does a man long for a battle to fight? Because when we enter the story in Genesis, we step into a world at war. The lines have already been drawn. Evil is waiting to make its next move. Somewhere back before Eden, in the mystery of eternity's past, there was a coup, a rebellion, an assassination attempt. Lucifer, the prince of angels, the captain of the guard, rebelled against the Trinity. He tried to take the throne of heaven by force, assisted by a third, uh, by a third of the angelic army, in whom he instilled his own malice. They failed and were hurled from the presence of the Trinity. But they were not destroyed, and the battle is not over. God now has an enemy, and so do we. Man is not born into a sitcom or soap opera. He is born into a world at war. This is not home improvement. It's saving, it's saving Private Ryan. There will be many, many battles to fight on many different battlefields. And finally, why does Adam long for a beauty to rescue? Because there is Eve. He is going to need her, and she is going to need him. In fact, Adam's first and greatest battle is just about to break out as a battle for Eve. But let me set the stage a bit more before Eve is drawn from Adam's side and leaves that ache that never goes away until he is with her, God gives Adam some instructions on the care of creation and his role in the unfolding story. It's pretty basic and very generous. You may freely eat any fruit in the garden except fruit from the tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. Okay, most of us have heard about that, but notice what God doesn't tell Adam. There is no warning or instruction over what is about to occur, the temptation of Eve. That is just stay staggering. Notably missing from the dialogue between Adam and God is something like this. Adam, one more thing. A week from Tuesday, about four in the afternoon, you and Eve are going to be down in the orchard, and something dangerous is going to happen. Adam, are you listening? The eternal destiny of the human race hangs on this moment. Now, here's what I want you to do. He doesn't tell him. He doesn't even mention it, so far as we know. Good grief. Why not? Because God believes in Adam. This is what he's designed to do, to come through in a pinch. Adam doesn't need the play-by-play -play instruction because this is what Adam is created for. It's already there, everything he needs in his design, in his heart. Needless to say, the story doesn't go well. 
Adam fails. He fails Eve and the rest of humanity. Let me ask you a question. Where is Adam while the serpent is tempting Eve? He's standing right there. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Then he ate it too. Genesis 3.6 the Hebrew for with her means right there, elbow to elbow. Adam is in a way in another part of the forest. He has no alibi. He is standing right there watching the whole thing unravel. What does he do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He says not a word. Doesn't lift a finger. He won't risk. He won't fight. He won't rescue Eve. Our first father, the first real man, gave in to paralysis. He denied his very nature and went passive. And every man after him, every son of Adam, carries in his heart now the same failure. Every man repeats the sin of Adam every day. We won't risk, we won't fight, and we won't rescue Eve. We truly are a chip off the old block. Lest we neglect Eve, I must point out that she fails her design as well. Eve is given to Adam as her Ezer Kenegdu, or as many translations have it, his help meet, help meet or helper. Doesn't sound like much, does it? It makes me think of hamburger helper, but Robert Alter says this is a notoriously difficult word to translate. It means something far more powerful than just helper. It means lifesaver. The phrase is also used elsewhere of God when you need him to come through for you desperately. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, who rides on the heavens to help you. Deuteronomy 33:26. Eve is a life giver. She is Adam's ally. It is to both of them that the charter for adventure is given. It will take both of them to sustain life, and they will both need to fight together. Eve is deceived, and rather easily, as my friend Jan Myers points out. In the hour of hope, Jan says, Eve was convinced that God was withholding something from her. Not even the extravagance of Eden could convince her that God's heart is good. When Eve was deceived, the artistry of being a woman took a faithful dive into the barren places of control and loneliness. Now every daughter of Eve wants to control her surrounding, her relationships, her God. No longer is she vulnerable, now she will be grasping. No longer does she want simply to share in the adventure. Now she wants control of it. And as for her beauty, she either hides it in fear and anger, or she uses it to secure her place in the world. In our fear that no one will speak on our behalf or protect us or fight for us, we start to recreate both ourselves and our role in the story. We manipulate our surroundings so we don't feel so defenseless. Fallen Eve either becomes rigid or clean. Put simply, Eve is no longer simply inviting. She is either hiding in busyness or demanding that Adam come through for her. Usually an odd combination of both. Alright, that is uh, page 50 through 54. What is a man for? Wild at heart, John Eldred. Love it. See ya.